2020. Um, I'm Charles Fay. I used to be employed by La Trobe University where I was um, a, um, a special professor in the history program. Um, today it's my pleasure to introduce um, my former colleague Ruth Ford and my former student Val Lovejoy who are going to talk about Monday was Washing Day, Farm Woman's Domestic Work 1920s to the 1950s. Um, Ruth and um, Val will speak for about 40 minutes and we'll have some questions after that. Okay, Ruth and Val, it's all yours. Thank you, Charles. Okay, so we'll just start with um, um, acknowledging the Jaja Wurrung as the traditional custodians of the land um, that we're on and recognise their ongoing connections to the land and unceding sovereignty. And I'd also like to acknowledge Jara elders, past and present, as well as any Indigenous participants present this evening. And um, Charles, do you just want to mention the, the great organisations that have organised this series? Oh, okay. Um, I've forgotten. I mean, I've, the, 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 the great organisations are, of course, the um, um, La Trobe University uh, History Program, which Bendigo Campus which we hope will continue in the future. Um, and um, the um, Goldfields Library Corporation and Bendigo Regional Archives. And I hope the last institution opens up soon, okay? <laughs> okay. Now, we're just going to end that. And just... Sorry, I'm just bringing up. The PowerPoints for Val and myself. Okay. So, um, Val and I will start. So every school holidays, I'd go from our Melbourne home to my grandparents' dairy farm at Blowhard near Ballarat on Wathaurong country. I remember my grandmother's amazing cooking, scones, brandy snaps, drop scones, lamingtons, sponges, sausage rolls, apple pies and fruit cakes, as well as the three course um, lunches and dinners. In between, she milked cows, separated, fed calves, washed, ironed and cleaned. And we loved playing in the old farmhouse cellar, filled with bottles of preserved apricots and peaches, jams and jellies and tomato sauce, as well as old butter churns and other relics from earlier decades. And these sensual memories of food and recollections of my grandmother's farm work contributed to my later interest in exploring the lives of rural women. My Australian Research Council research project, Women Working on the Land, aimed to investigate rural women's work. And Valerie Lovejoy worked with me on the project. And as part of that, we interviewed 80 women born between 1909 and 1934 in southeastern Australia. And in this paper, Valerie and I will examine these women's memories of domestic work. So we're gonna take you on a whirlwind tour of rural women's domestic work, beginning with Kathleen Robinson's account of her mum's initiation into rural domestic work. And I'm afraid we don't have the sound, um, the audio clip. When dad and mum were first married and dad killed the first sheep, he brought it in and put it in the kitchen, two halves of a sheep and went off down the paddock. Mum was faced with two halves of a sheep that she'd never seen the likes of in her life. Not to be outdone, she got Flora Pell, her cookery book, and hacked away until she got it cut up. Dad's friend heard about this and he got a real talking to. Next time, Ernie, when you do that, ring me and I'll come up. She had 10 children, but she got on her horse and rode 10 miles to show Mum how to cut up a sheep. Kathleen's mum, Ivy Hudson, grew up in Malvern in Melbourne's eastern suburbs and worked in a city library before her marriage in 1921 to Robert Staples, a Wimmera wheat sheep farmer. 
and Ivy moved to his um, wheat sheep farm at Warap near Rainbow. And Kathleen, her only child, was born in 1923. Kathleen's story emphasises differences between rural and urban women's domestic lives, as well as highlighting the ways rural women supported wives new to farm life by sharing domestic knowledge. The pattern of rural, rural women's lives was structured by domestic work. Margaret Miles, who grew up on a 600 acre sheep and cropping farm, recalled, housekeeping in those days was a pattern. Monday was washing, Tuesday ironing, Wednesday was patching and darning. Thursday, perhaps you had to go somewhere. Friday was cleaning and baking. Saturday was getting ready for Sunday. We cleaned all the boots and shoes in the house and polished the cutlery. Sunday dinner was always got ready. And that's um, a picture of Margaret. <laughs> now, Dawn Petchell from Rainbow was the daughter of a farm labourer and she married into a farming family of German origin. And her wedding gifts give a sense of a farmer's wife envisaged domestic life. Dawn and Lynn had six children, five of whom survived into adulthood. Describing herself as a farmer's wife, Dawn recalled a similar working rhythm. You washed on Monday, ironed on Tuesday, polished the floors and stuff on Wednesday, cooked on Friday because you were going to the tennis or something on Saturday, and had visitors on Sunday. While the activities accorded to to each day varied across farm households with few labour-saving devices and no electricity. Performing these domestic tasks took much time and physical hard work and were all necessary to keep the family fed and the house clean. Washing clothes was one of the most onerous jobs, carrying the water, scrubbing clothes, rinsing, wringing out and hanging out were hard manual labour. According to Gwen Jenner, who grew up on a fruit block at Merbeen, washing day was a nightmare. Lillian Hahn, on a mixed 136 acre farm at Digger's Rest, at Digger's Rest remembers her mother still washing the socks and trousers when she came home from school. She washed, washed all day. We had a huge line and it would be full. There were sheets everywhere. Washing occurred either in the wash house a shed separated from the house or frequently outside in the backyard. Some earlier um, settler farm women washed in cut down kerosene tins while others had galvanised iron tubs and the water was heated and manually carried to the tubs or a fire lit underneath, underneath them to warm the water. By the 1920s many women had cement troughs in the wash houses. Everything had to be scrubbed until clean with the aid of a wooden or glass washboard. Farmers' clothes were particularly dirty and could also be strained, stained with grease or oil. Ollie McClellan's mother, on a mixed farm at the Elba, made her own soap, which Ollie recalled was as hard as rocks and used as a scrubbing brush for men's clothes. Whites, such as sheets, table linen and nappies, were boiled in the copper, which had a fire lit underneath it. And Kathleen Robinson vividly remembered washing day. Mother had a copper out in the open and on the veranda was a wash house, which was like a trestle with about six tubs on it. They'd be filled up with water from the tanks and the copper and, mo and mother would boil the clothes and put the linen in to rinse and then into the blue, and then we'd put them on the line. In areas of water scarcity, washing water could be saved and reused, for gardens mostly, and Kathleen recalled her mother's thrift from water saving. After we'd done all the washing, we'd leave those tubs. The next day, we'd skim the soap suds off, and that was mother's watering for the week for the garden. She had a beautiful vegetable garden and a little flower garden. It was amazing how much mother could grow with the vegetables with just that amount of water and beautiful vegetables and later flowers too. Ollie McClelland also recalled that the soap suds were never wasted, 
but used to clean the red bricks paving the veranda. We'd get a bucket and what was left over in the wash tubs or the copper, we'd throw the water on, we'd get a straw broom and rub that on to clean it. They looked really good cleaned up. Ironing was another equally time consuming, um, was equally time consuming hard work, taking as much as a whole day a week in times of natural materials like cotton and linen and no electricity. Sheets were made of cotton, tablecloths were starched and every garment had to be ironed. Sisters Kath and Isabel Roberts from a sheep cattle farm in the Wimmera had vivid memories of heating the flat irons on the wood stove. You'd have that many sitting there. You had to have the stove fired up. Even on a hot day, the stove would be flat out. Many women ironed on the kitchen table, which was covered with an ironing blanket and sheet. Other women had ironing boards. But not all women detested ironing. Gwen Cole, who grew up on a wheat sheep farm at Gower East in the Wimmera, quite enjoyed ironing the tablecloths. They were all white and starched back in the early days. It was something you put pride into, having nice iron tablecloths. Some interviewees contrasted their own memory of a significant job that has largely disappeared, marvelling that women don't iron th these days. But Dawn Petrel confessed that she still likes ironing. I'm a bit of an ironer. Okay, cleaning. So a similar pride was taken in keeping the house spick and span. And the difficulty of doing this in a farm environment where dirt and mud was likely to be brought in and the air can be dusty cannot be underestimated. Lillian Han recalled that the house had to be cleaned from one end to the other each week on the appointed day. Sweeping, mopping, and polishing wooden boards and rhino for those who had it was hard work. And Ollie McClelland vividly remembers washing floors. Once a week, you'd get down on your hands and knees with a cloth, a dish of water and a scrubbing brush, and you'd go over that floor on your knees. Mind you, your knees were sore after, but you took a pride in scrubbing it up until it looked nice and clean. Later on, we'd put polish on it, another hands and knees job. Some people were lucky, they had a mop, but mum didn't think much of a mop. She said you couldn't get it clean properly. Willie McClellan's eldest son presented her with a tin of Fisher's wax for Christmas. She thinks he so, of, he so often saw her getting around on her hands and knees, he thought it was her favorite thing. Washing and polishing floors was just one of a myriad of cleaning tasks. Polishing taps and silver doorknobs and doorsteps, removing ashes from and replenishing um, and cleaning out wood stoves and fireplaces and maintaining the Coolgardie safe occupied hours of a woman's week. And then there was dusting, exacerbated by dust storms, especially during drought years, which made dusting a thankless and repetitive task. Margaret Miles recalled, they would come in from the west like a black cloud. And Flora Noyce from the 640 acre Millowa wheat farm said, it was dreadful for the wives because it was virtually sand inside the house. And the house, housework routine on any day could be disrupted by a dust storm, which covered everything in a layer of sand necessitating a thorough clean. Sometimes you'd have to dust the house about three times a day and sweep it all out. And then another dust storm would come, recalled Jean Gans, who was also from a miller or wheat farm. Sorry, it's, it's, my, turn. it's my turn now. Um, so Ruth's been talking to you about um, some of the really difficult and kind of time consuming tasks like the washing, the ironing and the cleaning. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about um, the craft work, the sewing and the knitting, the cooking and the preserving. Many farm households needed to be thrifty and self-sufficient 
With no money to spare for new clothing, women set to and made clothes for the whole family. If she was lucky, the woman had a sewing machine to help with this task. But jumpers, cardigans, even socks were hand-knitted or crocheted. Much sewing and knitting was plain and simple, but some women possessed a high level of skill, skill in sewing, knitting and crocheting and were able to make clothes for neighbours and friends, which earned them a little income. Clothes were not discarded as they are often today when they developed holes, but passed down from one child to another until they were thoroughly worn out. Women mended, patched and darned the clothes to give them an extended life. Sheets were darned and worn shirt collars turned inside out. Tackling the mending basket was usually done at night after the work of the day had been completed. Isla Clay's mother on a 1,000 acre wheat sheep farm at Barnardown along the Campaspe River made all the family's clothes, including the shirts and flannels for the men. Flannels were popular being made of wool as they soaked up the perspiration. She also made evening dresses for her family and neighbours. Alison Whiting from a Merbeam fruit block and dry sheep and wheat farm remembered her mother, Hilda Curtis, even making hats. Hilda never wasted a moment, according to Alison. She'd peck the cows out somewhere, perhaps in a restricted area where they shouldn't have been, and she'd just sit there and she'd have her crocheting with her. Alison regarded these precious hours as a way to satisfy her creative instincts, besides keeping the house clean and all the other things she was required to do. Often sewing fell to the daughter of the family. Bessie Briggs on a 300 acre dairy farm at Bedarang in the Kiwa Valley made the clothes for her mum and her sisters. Bessie was largely self-taught from the Home Journal, a monthly magazine. Bessie's younger sister was the knitter of the family. She used to do a bit of knitting to sell for pocket money. Gwen Cole on a 1,000 acre mixed farm at Gower East was the lucky recipient of a Wertheim pedal model sewing machine for her 14th birthday. I did a lot of sewing for myself, my family and my friends. Also fancy work, knitting and crochet. After marriage, Gwen continued to do all her own sewing for myself and the boys, even grey flannels for work for Uncle Bob who lived with us. Sewing was also done for families by grandmothers. Joyce Mousley, the daughter of a farm manager at Deer Park, said that her grandmother would come up and have a sewing session making things for us. In those days, things were handed down, even from one generation to the next generation. Grandmother made us some beautiful dresses, silk dresses, and she crocheted medallions on them. Domestic sewing skills were also crucial to farm work. At harvest time, daughters and wives were often involved in sewing up wheat bags. Kath Robinson recalled that she went early in the morning with my father to sew the bags up. My job was to thread the needle and do what they call the ear of the bag with three stitches. Dad would finish it because it had to be jammed tight. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the cooking now. Now, we know a fair bit about the cooking because uh, the women we interviewed talked about their mother's cooking and we know that all children uh, really love the cooking of their own families, especially the things that their mother produced when they came home from school. But cooking followed a routine like other household chores. One day a week would be set aside as baking day on which everything could be prepared in advance. On that day, Often that day would be Friday in preparation for the weekend when visitors might come for afternoon tea or dinner. Children looked forward to treats such as sausage rolls, sponges, cream lilies, lamingtons, cream puffs, apple cakes, scones and pikelets and they loved the smell of their mother's baking when they returned from school. Typically the food reflected the British heritage of many farm families. Eileen Burke who grew up on a mixed cropping farm at, oh, sorry, a mixed cropping and sheep farm at Muscarie, 
spoke of the plain and wholesome food her mother cooked. Meat pies and dumplings and plum puddings, apple pies, roast lamb and stews with everything in the vegetables. We always had porridge for breakfast and toast, and in those days, you had a fried egg. The dishes that were served up each day in many households followed a weekly pattern. For example, a Sunday roast dinner was followed by shepherd's pie on Monday to use up the leftover lamb. Catholic families didn't eat meat on Fridays and salmon patties were a popular choice. Meals comprised at least two, quarter, two courses with puddings or other desserts forming part of the main meal of the day. Farmers needed three sustaining meals a day, beginning with a cooked breakfast for the physical hard work of the day. Morning and afternoon tea were often carted to the paddock for smoko. Women's cooking work was also affected by the seasonal farm calendar. During shearing and harvest, when extra, layer was, when extra labor was needed on the farm, professional shearers or chaff cutters added to the mouths to feed and to women's labor. After she left school at 14, Margaret Miles remembered taking hot dinners to the shearers at the shearing shed five miles away from their homestead. We cook up the dinner at home and pack it into boxes, roast meat and two or three veggies and a pudding. Mum was good at lemon tarts. You'd drive down to the shearing shed, spread out something on the table and dish out the meals. Often the shearers would stay at the house for the two or three days they were shearing. You'd have to give them breakfast at seven o'clock, morning tea at nine o'clock, dinner at 12, afternoon tea at three, and tea when they finished. Mel Dobson on a 500 acre dairy mixed farm at Benalla recalled the traveling chaff cutter. She empath empathized with her mother's extra burden at harvest time. All the farmers would come and help with that because the bags had to be carted. They never thought of the poor old cooks who had to feed them all. Sometimes there'd be 12 or 14 on the chaff cutter. For farm women, Sundays were a welcome reprieve, but it was hardly a day of rest for rural women. The children needed to be made presentable for church, a roast dinner put in the oven for the midday meal and pudding prepared, and afternoon tea baked for Sunday afternoon visitors. And the cows still had to be milked morning and night. Monthly meetings of the local CWA, membership of a local sporting club, attending an occasional dance or charity ball, or mother's clubs at the local school provided the company of other women in similar situations. They gave reprieve from loneliness, but not from hard work, as women had to cater for these events and bake for cake stalls, raising money to support their children's education and sporting activities. To make the family food, the women re re relied largely on what could be provided on the farm, as well as making their own cakes and biscuits. Many farm women made their own bread. Milk and cream from the cow kept to supply the household also provided the family's butter. The chooks provided fresh eggs. Cream went to the local cream factory and other farm foods surplus to the family requirements <coughs> was sold or bartered for flour, sugar, tea, tinned food and vegetables. Where there was enough water, family farms usually had their own fruit orchard and vegetable garden. Women cooked seasonal produce from their gardens. Jean Gray's family on a 640 acre wheat farm at Moringa in the Milloa grew cabbages, silver beet, cauliflower, radishes, carrots and turnips. In many rural and remote areas, fresh greens were only available if grown on the farm. Climbing beans, broad beans, peas, and silver beet were common green crops. Some women used herbs to enhance the flavor of bland vegetables like marrow, which were often in abundance. Margaret Miles admiringly commented about the marrows that mum used to cut the ends off and scrape out the middle, stuff them, and roast them. Everybody knows they're not, they weren't very appetizing. But mum was very cluey. She grew thyme and sage, which not many people did. She was a great reader. She read everything. Just as Flora Hill's cookery book saved the day for Kath Robinson, faced with having to cut up a sheep, 
recipe books and recipes in the women's pages of rural newspapers provided ideas to farm women. Women also preserved their own fruit and vegetables, which would keep for a year if bottled, and made their own jams, conserves, marmalades and jellies, as well as tomato sauce, chutney, relish and pickles. Before bottling came into vogue, fruit was commonly made into jams and chutneys or sun-dried to preserve it for use through the year. Cucumbers and beetroots could be pickled and beans dried. Pumpkins and potatoes would keep for months and vegetables such as carrots could be stored in cool cellars for later use. But by the 1920s, Fowler's Vicola outfits graced most farmhouse kitchens. Fruit was neatly placed into bottles, covered with a sugar syrup, and the bottles boiled on the stovetop for an hour or more to sterilise and seal them. Fruit preserved in this way would last the whole year and improve the variety of the family diet. Tomatoes and vegetables, such as cucumbers and beetroots, could be preserved by the same me method. Most fruit and vegetables ripened in summer or early morning, so preserving was a hot and tiring job. Peg Pettigrew grew up on a 22-acre orchard in the Goulburn Valley. She recalled that her mother made all the jam from home homegrown gooseberries, raspberries, and all those other things. Meat produced on the farm was also preserved. Kath Robinson recalled that the meat was generally salted. We had a little cellar under the kitchen cupboards. You'd put the meat down there to salt it and churn it every day. The cool air also came up through the kitchen cupboards from the cold cellar and kept the food in those cupboards cool, which was very ingenious, I think. Gwen Jenner remembered her mother teaching her about different meat cuts. Dad butchered the cow or sheep and hung it in the meat safe. It would dry a crust around the meat, which would keep it, and they would salt a lot. Most farms kept at least one pig, which would be fed with the skim milk, and once a year the pig would be killed, cut up, and preserved. They did get a new pig after that. <laughs> Gwen's family used to kill a pig and make bacon once a year. They had a barrel with brine in it, and later they rubbed salt on it. Gwen Mousley from Deer Park recalled that everything that could be used for cooking was saved from the slaughtered animal. Though the cooking of sheep, pigs and cattle was mainly men's work, women killed and plucked the chooks. And I just want to talk briefly as I finish my section about the pride that women took in their domesticity. Um, I interviewed Dawn Petchell um, in Rainbow, where she'd retired after her husband died. Um, and she, she had had a, a difficult childhood, but had married well into a German family and had a very comfortable life on a thriving farm where she undertook the traditional duties of the farmer's wife. By the time of our interview, though, um, yes, as I said, she was a widow and she'd moved into Rainbow. Now, it was remarkable at the interview the degree of hospitality and generosity that she showed in the short time that I was there. They weren't obvious just to me, but during the morning, during our interview, she had no less than four visitors who were just dropping in to have a cup of tea and, uh, and share in the produce that she was, she was making. So as we sat down in her kitchen, Dawn offered me a cup of tea, of course, cream lilies and scones for morning tea. She had famously won the Oyen Vanilla Slice competition and was also eager to share her prize winning recipe with me. Dawn's pride in her cooking and her hospitality was not unusual among these women. Farm women took pride in, their in the quality of their cooking, their knitting and their needlework which provided them with a creative outlet and contributed to their self-esteem. Community appreciation and rivalry sometimes at bring a plate catering for sporting and cultural events such as dancing or funerals was common. Some women jealously regarded their prize winning recipes for sponge cakes or scones, while other women shared them in their communities or via the women's pages. Of rural papers. 
Thanks, Ruth. Over to you, Ruth. Ruth, you're mute. Thank you. <laughs> Having given you a glimpse of um, some of the stories of farm women's domestic work, we now want to examine four characteristic of characteristics of rural women's domestic labour. The family division of labour by gender and age, the financial contribution of women's domestic labour, women's attitudes to domestic work, and generational differences in domestic labour due to technological changes. So while um, farm, paddock and cropping labour was mainly the responsibility of the husband and sons, Domestic labour was the province of the females of the household, including young single women after leaving school. Women received little help from their husbands and much domestic labour was often relentless and unrewarding. A woman's domestic labour gave her no rights beyond societal approval. Despite the importance of the farm women's role in keeping the farm functioning effectively, few women enjoyed an equal relationship with their partner. They were not considered an equal partner on the farm and could not sign legal ownership documents. However, the type of farm also affected the partnership. If a woman undertook extensive farm duties, as often occurred on dairy or poultry farms, then some partners gave more assistance in domestic chores. After young women left school, usually at the age of 14, after gaining their merit certificate, they were expected to earn their keep. If they remained at home, they fully shared the domestic duties. And most mothers managed and supervised their tasks, teaching their daughters in preparation for marriage and family life. However, other women did less domestic work after their daughter left school. Joan Horsborough recalled that when her mum left school, her grandma said, right, you've got the housework, I'm going outside. When mothers were still of childbearing age and raising infants or young children, older daughters absorbed more of the domestic load. Isla Clay said of her elder sister, Mum was having a baby every second year. That was a lot of work. She was 17 and she was doing the lion's share. The story goes that when she knew Mum was expecting again, she'd start to pray and she'd pray for her sister. She was pretty lucky when she got me. Hazel Day had one brother who helped his dad on the farm. But after Hazel left school, she polished floors, saying, I kept them very clean. Hazel also did the washing and the ironing. And while Hazel's mother had the responsibility for cooking and meal preparation, um, prepare preserves and jams. Heavy physical labour took a toll on women's bodies. As women aged or were struck down with ill health, daughters took on heavier jobs. In a family with more than one daughter, some daughters worked together, while others were allocated a specific domestic role. Bessie Briggs's mother milked cows twice a day, in addition to her domestic duties. As soon as they left school, Bessie and her sisters worked in the dairy. Their mother suffered from ill health for six years before she died at the age of 54. One daughter helped her father with farm work, but Bessie and her other sisters shared the domestic duties between them. And Bessie graphically remembered her own physical fatigue from her heavy workload. Similarly, Elizabeth Caldicott is convinced that stress and exhaustion caused her mother's early death. She was exhausted by Housewifery, drudgery, the manual labour in that house, no appliances, no one to help. Women's domestic work on farms was affected by the financial circumstances of the family. Wealthier farm families often had domestic help, either day help or live-in domestic servants, which relieved the women from many of the, um, the arduous and tedious tasks. However, these families were a small minority of those we interviewed in northern and northwestern Victoria. 
Most domestic labour was unwaged and non-income producing. And the purpose and responsibility was to provide for the physical and emotional, emotional needs of the woman's partner and children. However, domestic family labour that produced an income, such as selling butter, cream, eggs and poultry, was often crucial in financially sustaining family farms um, between the annual income from wheat, wool and horticulture. And I want to talk about women's attitudes um, to their domestic labour, which Val has touched on. But Winifred McClellan from the Wimmera said, we just did it. No one had an attitude. We just did it and thought nothing of it. I think it because, because they were bigger families. We always had so many mouths to feed that there was plenty to do. I never heard anyone say we were overworked. We were certainly underpaid because we didn't get any money, but we coped and were clothed and fed. And similarly, Bessie Briggs commented, it's just been my life. I've accepted it. I've been happy in my life. I've had, I've had hardships but then everyone has them. In contrast, Mary Chalkley described the whole jolly lot as hard when talking about her work life as a child on the farm. She resented the heavy workload she was required to undertake, which she attributed to her mother's neglect of her responsibilities. Mary's mother was responsible for running the farm while her dad worked off, off farm. You didn't get your tea until 10 o'clock at night and you'd be out the next morning at 6 a.m. milking them damn things before you went to school. There was nothing in between because as soon as you got home, there was going to be last night's tea dishes in the sink and the separator was still waiting for you. It was seldom that I got to play with other kids. Not all women were bound by domestic duties. Joan Borowski commented, as far as the land is concerned, the fact was my life was no cooking and no knitting. She emphasized that her husband was marvelous in the fact that he looked after the children and did whatever was necessary, just the same as I did whatever he was needing. That was the success of our life together. We both respected what each of us was doing and we did it together. Joan regarded both lack of formal education and lack of mechanisation or modern conveniences on farms as being responsible for the way farm women were treated. Joan believed the country woman's lot was nothing else than slavery. They weren't expected to have any brains or how to use them if they had them. And they were married to cook and knit or repair the holes in his pants. Yet domestic work was also a source of pride and a creative outlet. Many rural women eagerly entered local agricultural shows and country women's association competitions in the household cooking section, which included scones, sponges, fruitcakes, ice cakes, jams, preserves and sweets. Anne Elias argues that the household section of agricultural shows could be accused of keeping alive a Victorian attitude towards women as homemakers, but suggests the primary motivation for the exhibitors include kudos and ambition. Although the household section concentrated on areas traditionally associated with women, women entered the pavilion competitions not to meet gender expectations, but rather for competition, kudos and fun, suggests Rob Edwards. Many women were thrilled when they gained prizes. And Martha Sear argues that by women exhibit, exhibiting their work, they were asserting the value of domestic labor. Yet to some extent, household section competitions in baking, home bottling, sewing, knitting and embroidery in both local and CWA group competitions reflected a societal view of the ideal woman as a domestic goddess and were related to ideas of domesticity. Associations like the Country Women's Association, to which many farm women belonged, played an important role in encouraging such attitudes. Neatly turned out and clean children were also seen to reflect positively on a person's mothering abilities. Even better, if the children were wearing beautifully knitted or sewn 
or hand sign crafted garments. The lack of labour saving devices and no electricity on many farms meant that most jobs required long hours of hard manual labour. And many farm women saw little difference from their mother's lives from the 1910s to the 1930s to the way they lived as adult women from the late 1930s to the 1950s. However, many women um, saw a major contrast um, between their own lives and those of the next generations of farm women from the 1960s onwards. Women believed that the advent of electricity and modern conveniences had considerably lessened the burden of hard physical domestic labour, making life much easier. Electricity arrived in many rural communities in the 1950s. It eliminated the maintenance of kerosene lamps and enabled electric refrigerators, which revolutionized methods of food storage and preservation. Electric washing machines, which eliminated the need for water carrying and manual scrubbing of clothes and the electric iron, which reduced the labor of ironing from an all day task to an hour or two. Jean Gann suggested that farm women today don't know they're alive. You put the washing in the washing machine, press the button, go and hang it out get the iron, electric irons, electric mix masters, electric vacuum cleaners, the phones, the televisions, the computers. It's not much different to living in a city house as far as mod cons goes. And cars also accorded rural women new freedoms. So according to Bessie Briggs, they are not so entangled with the husband or the farm itself. Lots of farm wives work off farm. They've got separate interests. So in conclusion, many farm women's lives were characterised by unrelenting hard labour, which left little time for leisure or off-farm activities. The lack of labour-saving devices and electricity made domestic tasks time-consuming and physically demanding. A daily and weekly domestic routine of jobs was necessary for essential sustenance and cleanliness. So we argue that despite women's accounts of long hours of physically exhausting hard work, their stories also suggest their pleasure and pride in their domestic achievements, with domestic work sometimes engendering self-esteem and providing creative outlets. And finally, we want to stress that women's domestic work was crucial to the family farm economy. Cooking for shearers, harvest workers and threshing teams was essential to family, farm, family farms' operations. Churning butter, cooking bread, cakes and biscuits, growing and preserving fruit and vegetables, sewing and mending, killing and plucking chooks and cutting up sheep, all reduced family living costs and enabled significant self-sufficiency. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, now I'm gonna get into all sorts of trouble here, Ruth. Um, That's fine, Charles. I'm, we'll I'm, we'll I'm, help I'm, you I'm, if you get stuck. Okay, so so thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to call for questions now. Has anybody got any questions? I can't. Uh, James has got one, Charles. Okay, now how do I do it? Um, oh, thank goodness I've retired and don't have to do all this stuff anymore. Um, James, you want to talk? I'll unmute you. Hang on, sorry, James. Oops, go ahead, James. Hang on. Oh, I, I can't unmute it, Ruth. Can you? Can you do yeah, that? Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to. Um, hold on. Let me see what's happening here with James. I've unmuted myself. Okay. <laughs> well done, James. Uh, well, uh, I've all the things that uh, both Ruth and Valerie have mentioned are very, very. Uh, reminiscent of how when we first came as migrants to Australia and spent nearly a year on a farm in the country, uh, it just is very evocative, the, uh, the things that were mentioned. Uh, and of course, my mother being uh, my father becoming a farm labourer and my mother then became the domestic servant on the farm. And uh, she experienced uh, all the things that uh, servants used to do for her back in Holland, so uh, that was quite an interesting contrast. However, uh, 
nothing was said about uh, the uh, way in which women prevented pregnancies. And uh, I know that our, the farm where we lived, the, uh, the lady of the house, uh, the farmer's wife, uh, late at night, as soon as the husband said, oh, we better go to bed, dear. Uh, no, she didn't go to bed. She'd pick up her petty point or some other sewing task. And by the time she went to bed, he was fast asleep. So in that way, it, uh, it, and, uh, you know, it, it's rather interesting. And I, I thought, you know, perhaps some mention could be made of these sorts of things because uh, it, it was important to try to uh, lessen the, uh, the load on women by uh, having less children. So uh, just a comment more than a question, really. Thank you both for a very, uh, very uh, thorough and very good presentation. Thanks, James, for that, for that comment. And, and I really um, was interested in what you said about your, um, your father and your mother. And when I've looked at the, um, the advertisements for domestic servants, you're, it's really common to see both um, farms advertising for a couple and they want a rural labour and they want uh, a housekeeper or a cook, usually a cook and a laundress. Um, and you also have couples um, advertising that they're available. But the women that we interviewed um, didn't work. Uh, some of the daughters worked as domestic servants, um, but, but we didn't find women that worked you know, on the farm as a, as a couple, rural labourer. And um, so I think that's really interesting because I think it shows that the, the women that kind of advertised to be interviewed were probably women that were, um, you know, perhaps slightly more well off. Um, I, think, I think also, Ruth, we did ask for interviewees who'd been brought up on a farm and lived on a farm for most of their lives. So they weren't really in that position, most of them. Although, as Ruth said, some had worked away on uh, when they were girls, after they'd left school and before marriage, some whose families couldn't afford to really keep them had moved to places like Bendigo to be domestic servants for a period of time. Um, and James, in terms of your second point about birth control um, and, um, and contraception and family limitation, um, we did have a little section on that, but we cut it out because our paper was way too long. <laughs> um, but I think, I think, you know, farm families are interesting because on the one hand, um, the number of children increases the amount of family labour that's available. Um, but on the other hand, it obviously increases the amount of domestic work and the cost. So it's kind of rural, the size of rural families, I think, is interesting. But you're absolutely right that women used um, really creative means in terms of birth control in an age in which um, advertising about birth control was illegal. Um, and obviously abortion was, was also illegal as well. So thanks for those great, great thoughts. Any other questions? I can't. I'll ask a question then, if no one else is going to lob in. Go, Charles. I, I just want to ask a question about your, your sort of methods and, and your eventual aim. You, you, how many people did you interview and were... You interviewed them in the early 2000s. Is the aim of your book to focus on a particular period of time um, or, or tell the sort of the life story of these farm women? Because I mean, it seems to me that, you know, you, 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 you hint at the end of your talk, there's obviously a massive change in living conditions in rural Australia in the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah, great question, Charles, as always. Um, so because of the, um, the constraints of time and money, um, we, did, we did have to limit it. We had more women who wanted to be interviewed than we could interview. So we aimed to get a cross section of both types of farms and um, regions of farms. So, you know, the Wimmera, the Mallee, the Northern District, 
Um, and we also aim to get a cross section of, of kind of sizes of farms. So, you know, the, the small fruit blocks, the small 136 acre farm at Dairies, at Diggers Rest, as well as the larger, um, you know, more, more well off farms. Um, so I guess that we were aiming to get a sense of women's diversity. Um, in terms of James's question about migrants, um, you know, we did we did attempt to interview um, women um, who had married, um, you know, German or Italian um, farmers, or were of um, that background themselves. But I, the project was very Anglo dominated, so I guess that's one issue we're aware of. Um, and I guess what we were struck by in terms of the generational shifts is the way that the women talked you know, a lot about their women's labour, like as much about their women's labour as about their own labour often. Um, but Belle, you might want to add to that. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think we're, we're uh, the period of time we want to cover is really from the 1920s to the 1950s. And, and that would be the period of the women that we interviewed, the period that they experienced growing up on farms as children, and also the times after their, their marriage as a wife and mother on a farm. And one of the things that we found, so we, we really want to cover those two generations, I think, isn't that right, Ruth? Yeah. But I think, I think what, what we found is that their lives were often remarkably similar in terms of the um, amount of work that they had to do and the type of work that they did to the lives of their mothers. So when we ask them, we just ask them at the end of the interview to reflect on the changes that they thought had happened today. And it was apparently apparent from that that they thought that these huge changes had really happened mostly beyond the time of their own period of child raising. So possibly some of these changes arrived, um, in, you know, sort of in the late 50s and 60s when the women we've interviewed, their children would have been well into their teenage years, probably. So, um, so I think that that's the time we want to cover. And I think what we have that's quite unique is being able to look at these two generations. I mean, there were some shifts, um, but um, it is interesting to look at the women's views of their mothers and what they learned from them and um, and how that reflected in their own life's journey as a, as a adult woman on the farm. So we're able to follow them right through from children to girlhood to adulthood. And I guess one of the things that we're also really conscious of is that we did, um, we did at that time back in 2009 when we did the original with um, the original interviews is that we asked the women over 80 at that point. Um, and so the women that we interviewed, you know, were born from, um, well, except for Hazel Day, who was a hundred and something back then. But, but you know, it is um, many of the women that we've interviewed have, have since died, which is um, really sad, but it's really fantastic for their families that we've got their kind of life stories recorded. So I think, you know, part of the project, as well as obviously the book, but it's also that I think there's this now, this amazing archive of women's stories too, of, of stories that, you know, that can't be told anymore. That's, that's very true. Any other questions? Anybody else? Come on. There must be a question coming out of that wonderful talk. James has got another question, Charles. Oh, James, go on, James, unmute yourself. You're good at it. I think I'm still unmuted, actually. Oh, okay. I'm very lucky. It's very hard to mute you, James. <laughs> uh, I, I'm ju just reflecting back uh, about going shopping 
uh, going into t uh, a small town in order to uh, to get uh, supplies like sugar and salt and things like that, you know, really essential things that, that were needed for uh, food preservation. Uh, did any of the women sort of comment on that or were many of them living very close to uh, a town where they could, uh, you know, uh, easily get these particular things? Um, I, can, I can remember one. Now, she lived just north of Bendigo and, and she was talking about her mother and she said that her father didn't seem to realise that the mother was living quite an isolated life. I think it was out of Bagshot or somewhere. But the farmer himself liked to have his day out. So he would take the horse and the gig and go into Bendigo to do the shopping on a Thursday, never thinking that she might like to go with him. So she spent that day at home while he went and got the supplies and had his catch up with his farmer mates who would perhaps go on the same day. I mean, that obviously didn't apply to everybody, but women were relatively isolated because of the um, lack of transport you know when you when you look back and you think no cars and all of that they were dependent a lot of them on their husbands um permitting them i guess to have the independence to be able to 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 go into town um and a lot of them did speak about the isolation of the life although others have said to us you know in these farming communities the farms were smaller, so the farms were closer together. And there were schools and public halls and little communities every few miles or so. Um, so that although people lived in relatively isolated circumstances, um, they did have a community, the women did have a community surrounding them very often. Um, so I guess there was a lot of neighborly cooperation and friendship there. And presumably that may have extended to um, the shopping as well. I'm not sure why you're waving the phone. I, I was uh, waving the phone because uh, this is how the farmers kept in touch because they were all on party lines, you know, and uh, everybody would be listening on it into everybody else's conversations. So, uh, of course, the people who missed out on that were the people uh, who were the domestics or uh, the farm labourers because they weren't connected to the phone. But, uh, yes, the, the telephone was a, a great communicator yes. and they knew all the gossip and what so-and-so did and so-and-so did and so on. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing in terms of media, um, now that we've got onto that topic, is also the the importance of radio. Um, I think it's the 75th anniversary of the Country Hour of ABC's Country Hour this week, um, and and radio. You know, many of the women talking talk about listening to the radio while they're milking cows, um, and the way that that created um, you know connection with with the world. Um, but also, of course, the papers were really important, um, and. Um, in, in the other book that I'm writing, which is just on women's letters to the rural press, um, you know, the community that was built up through those women's pages and, you know, letters where people are writing saying, I've got a baby coming, I've got no baby clothes, has anyone got some, can people swap me a this size shoe for something else? You know, that those kind of um, connections are happening um, you know, often through through mail, through pen friends, through the women's pages, um, as well as the ways that Bell's highlighted through those community networks of mothers, you know, school mothers groups, um, sporting clubs, um, you know, country women's association as well. I think we're getting to the end of our time. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ruth and Val for a wonderful talk and. Uh, I must say, um, we look forward to the uh, book because this is obviously a, um, a wonderful resource. These interviews are um, 
quite quite uh, astounding, I think. Um, just before we go, I'd like to say that um, the seminars will be returning after a Christmas break in February. And I think in February they're still going to be online, but Ruth is hoping that by March it will be a live audience again. Hold on, let me just um, find the... My, there it is, sorry. So just the February event. Um, Desiree um, Petit Keating from um, the Archives Officer at BRAC will be talking about History Never Repeats, the Sandhurst Responses to Infectious Diseases, um, to Infectious Disease. And so that's going to be a really um, fascinating paper as well. So hope to see you there. Okay. Well, thanks very much and we'll call it closed. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, James. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.